It's the who's who of people who have been kicked off of Twitter and Facebook. Anyone from Donald Trump to Mike the Pillow Guy Lindell are racing to start a new brand of social media. They advertise them as spaces with no discrimination, freedom of speech, and limited moderation. They start these with the idea that conservative voices are being silenced, which by the way, is just factually untrue. And I know it's gonna piss a lot of people off right off the bat, so hi. As the right wing social media platforms and even phones continue to flood the market, some of them fly while others fail. But what are the intentions behind these new forms of social media? And are they freeing or dangerous? Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about right-wing social media. In 2021, massive controversy and shock spread across the internet when prominent singer, actor, and activist Demi Lovato decided to promote and become an ambassador for the streaming site Gaia. Given Demi's background and multiple instances of speaking out about misinformation during the Donald Trump administration, it was absolutely shocking to see them endorse Gaia. What was even more shocking was the content they were promoting. It was everything from a series of Atlantis being real to humanity living in the aftermath of a battle between giants and lizard-like reptilians. To see a prominent and supposedly extremely progressive person suddenly start promoting wildly untrue conspiracy theories was in short, concerning. Gaia had become relatively well-known for promoting conspiracy theories and being quote, a hub for QAnon. It has become a relatively safe space for QAnon members and promoters to come after they've been largely barred from utilizing social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter. Most of the videos promoted on Gaia revolve around UFOs and alien conspiracy theories that find and discuss what they call the nature of reality. But they have also been a hub for people like David Icke who has spread the reptilian overlords theory and the anti-vaccination theories. For a big star with millions of followers and a young fan base, this type of affiliation can be slightly worrisome. But as conspiracy theories and strong emotions about political affiliation continue to grow, so do these types of social media sites and the faces that promote them. We've seen conspiracy theories span from harmless to extremely dangerous on these sites. And as more continue to amass into the public view, it seems important to understand where they're coming from, who are the people who create them and how they're being monitored, if at all. We'll talk about a few of the right-wing social media apps in a little bit more detail individually, but first I wanna start and address a question. Where do these things come from? Many, if not all, come as competitors of the mainstream and widely popular social media sites like Facebook and Twitter. The owners of the social media sites Gab and Parler, among others, describe their social media platforms as anti-Twitters that advertise minimum moderation and the importance of free speech. The owners of these types of social media all have one thing in common. They feel marginalized by mainstream social media sites. Take Gab, for example, which was one of the first and biggest platforms of its kind. Developed in 2016, the CEO, Andrew Torba, said he had the idea to start the platform after the widespread controversy surrounding Facebook's fact-checking and their apparent sidelining of conservative topics in their trending feature. Torba said he saw Gab as a way to step up and defend free speech, defend individual liberty, defend the free flow of information that I saw under attack. Torba said he not only felt isolated and disenfranchised on mainstream sites, but also felt that way in his own environment as a conservative living in Silicon Valley. Others like Jared Thompson and John Matsey, the CFO and CEO of Parler, share similar views and rhetoric as to why they decided to develop the now infamous application. Similar to Torba, Thompson and Matsey were both relatively unknown before developing the app, but shared their enthusiasm to start one that focused primarily on free speech. After the release in 2018, Parler was able to gather some highly notorious investors to support the app. Rebecca Mercer, who Vox calls a conservative mega donor and the daughter of Robert Mercer, a billionaire, is the lead investor for Parler and called the site a beacon to all who value their liberty, free speech, and personal privacy. Matsy said that on the Parler app, freedom of speech is key regardless of the topic. And if you can say it on the street of New York, you can say it on Parler. These first few social media platforms seem to be developed by lesser known people, but then the 2020s came into play. Twitter and Facebook began cracking down more and more on the spread of misinformation or potentially harmful rhetoric. So bigger celebrities and names began getting into the game. In 2020, when Donald Trump lost his bid for re-election, seriously, he lost, I promise, it's been proven, the post claiming conspiracy and supposed proof that he had won started to flood social media. Some of them coming from Donald Trump himself and others coming from people like Mike Lindell, you probably know him as the MyPillow guy, caused Facebook and Twitter to eventually ban both of them from using their site. And as you can imagine, people didn't react to this too well, especially not Donald Trump or Lindell. 
After being banned from Twitter, Facebook, and Vimeo in the span of two months, Lindell said he would be starting his own social media platform so all the voices of our country can come back and start telling it like it is again. Lindell had been banned from these platforms for spreading misinformation about voting, the election results, and the coronavirus vaccines. But he felt he was being canceled and said these big platforms were suppressing our conservative voices. Lindell's Frank app has yet to be fully developed and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Donald Trump quickly began advertising a new social media platform called Truth Social after he was banned from Facebook and Twitter. The site, much like others, promises free expression and also claims it does not discriminate against political ideology, according to the welcome email sent to people waiting on the massive wait list. Not only do these platforms share incredibly similar origin stories, but they also seem to share the fact that they resemble their competitors, Twitter and Facebook, in multiple aspects of their layout. For example, Trump's platform uses many of the features of Twitter, but with a twist. Instead of blue, the platform is purple, and instead of tweets, the posts are made by users called truths. You still get a username, replies are called replies, and likes are still called likes. But other than a few minor changes, you're still basically getting a slightly different type of Twitter. Gab has also been developed to mimic Twitter and Reddit's unique style while guaranteeing minimum moderation and a safe place for people to say virtually anything they want. These right-wing social media sites have garnished so much news and popularity that there is even a phone being advertised that comes with all of these people's favorite right-wing social media pre-programmed right into the Freedom Phone. But before we get into that little joy called the Freedom Phone, let's get to know a little bit more about these apps. So let's go deeper into Gab, Parler, Frank, Truth Social, and then of course the Freedom Phone. As I mentioned briefly before, Gab was released in 2016 as a reaction to what the CEO, Andrew Torba, called the mass censorship by social media platforms. With a wide range of right-leaning users being banned or thrown in Facebook jail for usually harassment or racist epithets or memes, they needed a new place to go. Enter Gab. Gab offered a new way of moderation. Instead of being monitored by the platform itself, posts were largely monitored by the users. Using upvotes or downvotes, users could decide which posts could stay on the app. Once a post reached a certain number of downvotes, it wouldn't necessarily be removed, but their reach would be severely reduced. The downvote feature was ultimately removed in 2017 because it was overused. Not exactly sure what they mean, but okay. Users of Gab also have the ability to mute words or users that they don't wanna see posts from or about. Gab explains the reasoning behind this decision in its community guidelines that read, "'We believe that the only valid form of censorship is an individual's own choice to opt out. Gab empowers users to filter and remove unwanted followers, words, phrases, and topics they do not want to see in their feeds. There are at least some things that Gab says are banned, which includes threats of violence, child pornography, pornography, and doxing. Doxing, by the way, means to release or publish someone's private information for purposes of revenge and humiliation. Despite these supposed regulations of the social media platform, it seems virtually impossible to be banned from it, and it happens extremely rarely. The site has also been found to be what the Southern Poverty Law Center calls a breeding ground for white supremacy. In a study done by the Cypress University of Technology, the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science and the University College of London, the researchers there found that Gab had about 2.4 times more hate words than compared to Twitter. Additionally, the author stated that after analyzing 22 million posts from 336,000 users, they found that Gab attracts the interests of users ranging from alt-right supporters and conspiracy theorists to trolls. Despite this, Gab continues to grow and has risen to at least 4 million users. Pretty predictably, to be honest, Gab has faced a wide range of scrutiny after acts of mass violence have been perpetrated by people who had been using their platform. The first of which, or at least the first well-known instance, occurred only two years after the platform's inception in 2018. And I'm going to briefly discuss an instance of mass violence and racist language. So if you'd rather skip forward to the next chapter, feel free to. It's just a couple minutes that we're gonna talk about this. If not, buckle up. In October, 2018, a shooter went to Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue and killed 11 people while wounding six others. After the tragic mass shooting, the shooter was quickly arrested and news began to spread of his worrisome social media usage and posts. Shortly before committing this horrific act, the man posted on Gab saying, quote, HIAS likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. In his post, he was referring to a Jewish nonprofit, HIAS, that works to assist immigrant refugees in the United States. If this post wasn't concerning enough, the perpetrator also had a lengthy history of using anti-Semitic language on Gab and calling Jewish people, quote, infestations. 
He also repeatedly used the numbers 1488 on his profile, which is apparently known as a white supremacist slogan or like dog whistle. If you don't know what that means, feel free to look it up. I'm not gonna repeat the offensive language that it apparently stands for. Following the immediate public outrage that Gab had failed to report or ban the shooter from their platform, the site went down. Following the incident, Gab displayed a message that it had been, quote, systematically no platform by app stores, multiple hosting providers, and several payment processors. We have been smeared by the mainstream media for defending free expression and individual liberty for all people and for working with law enforcement to ensure the justice is served for the horrible atrocity committed at Pittsburgh. Indeed, Gab had been cut off from PayPal, its primary payment system, and GoDaddy, their web hosting site after its controversy. Despite the near immediate adverse reaction from the general public, the CEO, Torba, defended the website and their choice not to remove the shooter's post. He claimed that it didn't really seem like a threat to him. He went on to say that the answer to bad speech or hate speech, however you want to define that, is more speech. It is important to mention that Gab did at least do some good in this situation and worked closely with both the Department of Defense and the FBI to bring justice to the alleged terrorist. Despite the massive backlash, the platform was able to find a new web hosting site and continued on. Gab had a year or two without any massive controversy, that is until the insurrection of January 6, 2021. Since the election of Joe Biden, Gab has become one of the most widely used social media sites for right-wing conservatives and Donald Trump supporters to voice their concerns about the fairness of the 2020 election process. Some of the new users joining the social media platform called for an increase in militia activity, saying that the stolen election called for an armed reaction. The CEO Torba even posted after Donald Trump's Twitter had been removed that Twitter users should get in the arc to leave mainstream social media. Then on January 6th, after a violent and deadly storming of the Capitol building during the Stop the Steal rally, Gab found themselves in the limelight once again. Shortly after, the Anti-Defamation League, a national anti-hate group in the United States, called on both the Department of Justice and the FBI to investigate both the platform and the CEO for their possible involvement in the event that shockingly unfolded. The group claimed that both Gab and its CEO may well bear a measure of criminal responsibility for the attack which in all honesty, may very well be true. Not only were users of the website posting about their increased use for armed militias after the election, but they were also, as reported by the ADL, exchanging information on directions for which streets to take to avoid the police. They were also coaching each other on what kind of tools to bring to the event to help pry open doors. Additionally, there were multiple posts that described users carrying guns into the halls of Congress. As the day progressed, the CEO himself made a post that read, in a system with rigged elections, there are no longer any viable political solutions. Despite these findings, when Torbo was confronted about the possibility of investigation, he instead pointed his finger at Facebook. And Torbo honestly doesn't really seem like a great person and an asshole, if I may say so, but he does have somewhat of a point here. Facebook has historically allowed for the spread of misinformation and hate group accounts on its site. But at the same time, you can do two things at once. Yes, investigate Facebook, but also investigate Gab. That doesn't negate Gab. Torba claimed that Gab put an immediate stop to a series of newly created accounts that were making threats of violence aimed at public officials. He also claimed that Gab had worked with law enforcement and warned their community against post-threatening violence. Despite all of this though, it still happened and Gab was still undoubtedly a website used to organize or promote it. The DOJ did eventually ask Gab to save its data, but so far there has been no in-depth investigation into the platform, at least not publicly by the DOJ or the FBI. The spike in Gab users can also be widely attributed to the public scrutiny of yet another right-wing social media platform called Parler. So let's switch gears and talk about that. Parler, run by CEO John Matsey and CTO Jared Johnson, had its start in 2018. What sets Parler apart in one major way from other social media platforms is its outrageous popularity among politicians, celebrities, and other major sources of funding and promotion. Parler quickly gained traction in conservative circles during the 2020 election. Many right-wing influencers such as Ivanka Trump, Sean Hannity, and Alex Jones had urged their followers to switch from Twitter to the far less moderated parlor during the election as a way to connect with other like-minded people freely and without the fear of being banned from the platform. Like Gab, Parler has also been found to be littered with people who claim affiliation with hate groups or white supremacist organizations such as the Proud Boys. Additionally, the platform has been utilized to spread conspiracy theories about vaccines and of course, the theory that the 2020 election was rigged. Parler was run from 2018 to 2021 with virtually no restrictions on the type of speech that could be used on the platform. 
Although they had used a volunteer community of content moderators, they were often overwhelmed. And like Gab, Parler largely relied on the individual users to hide content that they did not want to see. They also had no regulations on gory or adult content, as long as it was marked sensitive by the user who created it. Unlike Twitter and Facebook, there were no fact checkers on the platform, so people could freely post misinformation. The CEO, Matsy, and in regards to Parler's lax regulations said, "'Our general premise is that we believe in the good of the American people as a whole, and that people should be able to have these discussions and let the crazies come out and let the world see who they are and talk with them and not let them hide and fester and do some nasty things.'" He continued on to say, "'If you can say it on the streets of New York, you can say it on Parler." As you would probably be able to predict, this type of business model can lead to some pretty shady situations, and that's exactly what happened in 2021, once again, with the insurrection. Following the January 6th insurrection, eyes started to turn to the right-wing social media platforms that allowed people to plan and communicate intentions for the Stop the Steal rally. While many people have claimed that the event was never supposed to become violent or end with the storming of the Capitol, Parler tells a different story. According to the company, they had sent information to the FBI more than 50 times that included posts threatening the United States Capitol. One sent on December 24th was a post created by a user who called for the congregation of an armed force of 150,000 on the Virginia side of the Potomac River to react to the congressional events of January 6th. Another, which Parler turned over on January 2nd, said that the user was planning on wearing body armor on January 6th, and it was not a rally and it's no longer a protest. Other posts shared that people were planning to take the Capitol building and called January 6th the final stand. Despite these claims by Parler that they had reported this information to the FBI, the FBI claimed they had no information prior to the event rather than there was going to be a rally. But as we all know, it wasn't just a rally and Parler seemed to be at the forefront of events that transpired as many people continued posting during the insurrection. Unfortunately for Parler, this was met with immediate and strict sanctions against them by giants of the tech world. Almost immediately after the January 6th storming of the Capitol, and I mean like within a week, Parler found themselves in a world of trouble with technology giants. Apple and Google both announced that they would be removing the app from their app stores, saying that the app had not sufficiently policed its users' posts, allowing too many that encourage violence and crime. Amazon quickly followed and announced that they would be removing Parler from their web hosting service. Now, as you can probably imagine, these announcements did not go over too well for people who had been actively on a platform to avoid moderation and sanctions. John Matsey responded to the news by saying, big tech really wants to kill competition. He went on to say these actions were a coordinated effort to completely remove free speech off the internet. Apple did give Parler 24 hours to clean their app. And while they did remove some especially violent posts, their efforts were not enough. And Apple said there was no place on their platform for illegal acts or violence. Parler sued Amazon quickly after being removed from the web hosting, saying they were attempting to reduce competition in microblogging services market to benefits of Twitter. However, they didn't get the result they anticipated and a federal judge quickly rejected their complaint. For many, this felt like this would be the end of Parler, but was it? No, no, it wasn't. Only a few months later, Parler returned with an abundance of new rules and changes. For one, they replaced the outspoken CEO Matsy with a new person, George Farmer. Additionally, Parler had added new algorithms that automatically detect violent content or incitements of violence. These changes and increased moderation didn't seem to scare off any new or old users as the platform went from 15 million users before their temporary shutdown to 20 million after their reappearance. Not only this, but they landed a major deal with the former first lady, Melania Trump. In February of this year, the platform announced that Melania Trump was part of a social media special arrangement in which she would share exclusive communications on Parler. Melania is extremely active on Twitter and Instagram, so it's not certain how this exclusive communications deal will impact that or even tell exactly what the deal will entail, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, speaking of Trump, you may have noticed that he's been relatively at the forefront, or at least his presidency has been, of all of these social media scandals and the mass exodus of conservatives from social media giants onto right-wing social media. Given this and him being the supposed savvy businessman that he is, you would think he'd want a part of the social media pie. Well, you thought right, and he has been attempting to create his own platform, though it hasn't exactly been going to plan. And before we jump into some of the more humorous failures of right-wing social media, including Truth Social, Frank, and of course, the upcoming chats about the Freedom Phone, let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors, because this content is something that you can't sponsor. Online shopping is not slowing down anytime soon, so is your business ready to keep up the pace? Well, with ShipStation, you'll never have to worry about shipping again. Make the switch to a solution that handles all your shipping needs quickly, affordably, and painlessly. 
You can save time by funneling all your orders into one simple interface and it doesn't matter where you're selling. Manage every order from Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or even your own website and from anywhere, even your phone. That's honestly one of my favorite parts of ShipStation is how easy it is to just kind of import all your data from all other places, whether it's the Instagram store, your own website, wherever, and it's just right there and all easy to manage. ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 e-commerce sellers and it keeps track of your orders. It finds the best shipping carrier with deeply discounted rates and you can automate just about any shipping task in just a few clicks, which is kind of sick. So ship more in less time with ShipStation. Use my offer code casket to get a 60 day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress free shipping at your fingertips. Just go to shipstation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in casket. ShipStation, make ship happen. For many people, getting financially healthy means dropping the weight of credit card debt, but where do you start when it feels like a never ending cycle? If you have multiple credit card balances every single month and are only paying the minimums, you're barely making a dent in your credit card debt, which can be really discouraging. Upstart can help you pay off your existing debt quickly so you can finally feel like you're getting ahead. And it's not just credit cards. If you're consolidating high interest debts, funding a personal expense, maybe using it to start up a new business, over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a very clear payoff date. And Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score. So rather than just looking at your score alone, Upstart models can look at other factors like your income, employment, and other information that you provide in your loan application to find you a smarter rate for the loan that you need. And you can check your rate online without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash casket. That's upstart.com slash casket. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit score, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Shortly after being kicked off of Twitter and Facebook, Donald Trump began to adamantly and consistently promote his idea to start his own brand of social media. And of course, like everyone else in this episode thus far, he said the new platform would promote free speech and offer limited constraints. Probably not so surprising, Donald Trump's platform named True Social has the largest amount of financial pull and influence in comparison to other sites, which you would think make it the most successful at launch. So far, this has not been the case, but we'll talk about that in just a second. In September, 2021, Trump Media, and yeah, he's got his own social media company, agreed that they would merge with Digital World Acquisition, which is a blank check or special purpose acquisition company. A blank check company is an organization that functions purely to merge or acquire other companies. Maybe Trump needed some extra cash and that's why he agreed to the merger. This wouldn't be the first time he depended on other people to fund his ideas. Now there is some good news and bad news for Donald Trump with the merger. The good news is together, the companies have been able to raise an outstanding $300 million from investors for Truth Social. The bad news, they can't touch any of it right now. Currently, Digital World is actually being investigated by regulators to determine if they broke securities regulations during their merger with Trump Media. And I don't know, something about that seems just, oh God, it's, so hard to believe. I mean, Trump being investigated in a business deal? Where have I heard this before? Was it maybe Deutsche Bank or the insurrection, Fox News, his presidential cabinet, the MLMs he's been involved with? I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Anyway. So for now, Trump Media, which is valued at a mind-blowing $10 billion, according to Digital World, is having to hire people themselves to work on Truth Social. So how is that platform doing? Well, absolute dog shit. Truth Social made its launch on President's Day in February, and already it was plagued by multiple technical difficulties that prevented people from opening accounts and placed hundreds of thousands of people on a wait list to get on the platform. Luckily, one journalist from Political was able to get in and gave us all the details from inside the app. The journalist describes the welcome email they received when joining that promised free expression and safety for all as they swore to not discriminate against political ideology. The writer says their experience on Truth Social has been lackluster so far, saying, quote, put simply, there isn't much happening on the site. There was one interesting discovery though, and that was a new type of crypto being offered on the app called Let's Go Brandon Token, described as the people's token. We'll have to keep an eye on that one though. And I I know me coming in with my opinions again, oh no, but uh, I just find it funny, the Let's Go Brandon thing. It just, I'll never stop laughing about it. The the group of people that claim to be all about free speech censoring themselves, like just say, fuck Joe Biden. Is is that so difficult? It shouldn't be that difficult, but apparently it is for them. So they have to censor themselves. And I just, I'm never gonna find that not funny. It's not triggering. It's probably one of the funniest things they've ever done. And I don't think they realize how funny it is. 
But despite Trump's near constant promotion of this new app, so far it seems like it's kind of falling flat and some are reporting that Donald Trump is not happy about this. Business Insider reported that Donald Trump was heard on a phone call swearing gratuitously and asking what the fuck is going on in response to the app's failed launch. Perhaps Trump's vision of becoming a social media giant is in the future, but so far it's not looking too great for him. Speaking of a failure to launch, Mike Lindell's app is also having some issues getting off the ground. So let's take a quick moment to pivot and talk about that. The Pillow King's new social media app, Frank, was promoted like all others, the importance of free speech, not like the tech giants, and all the same talking points we've been regurgitating thus far. Lindell promised that Frank would be a combination of print, radio, and TV, and even made the promise that Frank would allow people to gain more followers than ever before, somehow. Unlike others though, Lindell said that Frank would moderate against certain things. It included the C word, the N word, the F word, or God's name in vain. So that's a thing. The announcement for his new app came as Lindell continued to fight a $1.3 billion lawsuit from Dominion Voting Systems after spreading misinformation about the election. As with others, I'm sure he had hoped the new app would be his new claim to fame, but thus far, that's not what happened. Like Trump's Truth Social, Frank has faced multiple issues trying to get off the ground. Released in April, Frank failed two times in one week when the app did not allow new users to sign up. Say that 10 times fast, because I butchered that. Frank failed, Frank failed, Frank failed. No, fuck. (laughs) Frank failed two times. Anyway, you guys know what I'm saying, I'm sorry. Now, those that tried to join were faced with a platform that repeatedly crashed and had an inaccessible homepage. To Lindell, this was a clear sign of a cyber attack though. And he wrote on his telegram, frankspeech.com is having a massive attack against it currently. We are working to get it up ASAP. Thank you for your patience. There's literally no evidence of such an attack and it's much more likely that the site simply didn't work. And that's just the excuse he went on to use to explain why the site was not able to go live despite him announcing that he spent millions to make sure the site was secure, but Okay, okay, Frankie. While we wait and see what happens to Truth Social and Frank, a new type of right-wing technology has appeared. Finally, we get to talk about the Freedom Phone. In a viral video posted in July, Eric Finman, a 22-year-old who claims to be the world's youngest Bitcoin millionaire, shared that he would be creating a new kind of smartphone with the help of some flashy graphics and a few pictures of Abraham Lincoln and Donald Trump. Finman says, like the others, that he is worried about Silicon Valley censoring conservatives and spotted a new type of business opportunity to become involved in politics and jump aboard the right-wing social media train, but in his own unique way. The Freedom Phone is meant to establish communication technology without using the likes of Apple and Google. Additionally, people's favorite right-wing social media comes preloaded on the device. Within days of posting the video announcing the new $500 phone, Finman had received thousands of orders. Of course, there was now a small problem of supply. At first, Finman was simply buying cheap Chinese phones from UmiDigi, which had chips that had previously been incredibly vulnerable to hackers. And I just kind of find it funny that he's using Chinese phones since most of Trump's platforms that people like agreed with was the whole America first thing. So what happened to that whole make America great again thing? Shouldn't you be using like American made phones? Like what's going on there, buddy? Anyway, considering Finman advertised his new type of cellular device as the best phone in the world, this didn't seem like a great plan. Furthermore, despite saying that the Freedom Phone would not rely on Apple or Google, it in fact did. But to hide this, he simply hired engineers to remove any sign on the phone that Google had been used. Shortly after his announcement of the phone, the criticism he received for relying on a Chinese phone manufacturer, Finman developed a new plan. Instead of relying on Chinese manufacturers and Google, he teamed up with Clear Cellular, who had developed a phone without the use of Apple or Google. Finman and Clear Cellular added American flag wallpapers, right-wing social media, and technological support for the new and improved Freedom Phone. According to Finman and Clear Cellular, orders for the new phone seem to be high and growing. Finman says there are orders for 12,000 Freedom Phones, which could lead to a revenue of about $6 million in the span of just a few months. But the reviews for the phone so far seem to be pretty lackluster. CNET said that the new $500 phone was nearly on par with a $200 budget Android phone, which is not a great comparison. Regardless, Finman seems convinced that he has created the next big thing in both the technology and political worlds. Finman says he plans to make the Freedom Phone available near polling stations, come elections, and heavily curate articles promoting conservative viewpoints. He says, I see it absolutely as one of the ultimate political tools. Everyone has one in their pocket. As the right-wing conservative social media world continues to grow and becomes a more saturated market, there are sure to be more of these types of uh, interesting developments that pop up. We didn't even have time to talk about all of them today because more just keep developing. It's just kind of fun to watch them just grow and fail. But as misinformation, hate speech, and conspiracy theories continue to grow online, so do these platforms that offer little to no moderation, which can kind of be a terrifying thought. 
But with all of that being said, that's where I'm gonna end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. Hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I appreciate you being able to spend some of your time here with me today. I hope you were at least somewhat entertained. I know I certainly was going through the research for this and uh, ta-da, here we are. So thank you so much for hanging out, enjoying today's episode, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.